Cool, Melinda, go for it. Wonderful. Welcome, welcome everybody to this uh, second session of Kingship in Business. <laughs> um, we're very excited to see and hear what God has been saying to our guest speakers. Our hearts are very open. And um, if I could just reread the scripture, which really is the solid foundation and basis of why we started this particular group called Kingship in Business. And the foundational scripture is in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 12 and 13. It's familiar to us, but I want to reread it. The Lord will open the heavens, the storehouse of his bounty, send rain on your land in season, and to bless all the work of your hands. You will lend to many nations, and will borrow from none. Lord will make you the head, not the tail. If you pay attention to the commands of the Lord your God that I give you this day and carefully follow them, you will always be at the top, never at the bottom. So as I was just seeking the Lord today about what to say in terms of this intro and how to kick this off, I want to ask you this. Is it God's desire that we prosper? Is it the Lord's desire that we have influence in the marketplace? Is it the Lord's desire that we as godly business consume the market? Is it God's desire that we successful and influential in our sphere of um, workplace and in the community? Does God want us to be in positions of leadership in the workplace and in our communities? Are his plans for you and I in our business brought to zero or not because of the economy? Well, A, it is God's desire for us to prosper. It is God's desire for us to have influence in the marketplace. It is his desire for us to be successful and influential and leaders in the workplace. He is not distracted by what's happening in the economy. His plans and purposes remain. And let me tell you and remind you, if it's in your orchard, the orchard of uh, God's, what God has set aside for you, for your business and for your life, no one can steal your fruit, you know. A, a few months back, God showed me this river that was coming out of Zion, right out of the throne room of God. And he was carrying us on top of that. There were business people on top of that. There was no all required. There was no boat. God was propelling you forward in every area of your life. Every obstacle that comes up upon you or in front of you, he was obliterating that. And of course, Isaiah, you know, chapter 41, verse 18, where he says, I'll make rivers in the desert. I'll make rivers in the desert. So God is busy propelling us forward all the time. I'm going to hand over to you now, Andrew, if you want to officially open a prayer. And then we're going to go straight into what Justine has to share with us. And uh, we'll have a quick interlude thereafter. And then we're going to go straight into Dean's sharing. And then we are hoping and trusting Holy Spirit for time afterwards for some ministry and some prophetic words over you and into your businesses. Bless you. Thank you, Andrew. Cool, cool, cool. Let's all pray. Heavenly Father, we just give you all the honor, the praise, and the glory. You are the Lord God Most High. You are the creator of all, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And we thank you, Father, that we could dedicate our time to your word today, to sharing, to connecting with each other and uplifting each other, Heavenly Father. I thank you for Dean and Justine and what they're going to bring today. We thank you, Father, that their words will write upon our hearts, that you will speak through them, Heavenly Father. There will be none of them but all of you, my Lord God. And we thank you that we all draw together. We can learn and listen to each other and encourage each other. But above all, Father, give you glory. Give your word glory. And your son, Heavenly Father, we thank him for all he did on the cross that allows us the freedom to sit here and celebrate life, Heavenly Father, eternal life of that. So, Lord, all honor, praise, and glory to you for the session. We thank you. There will be no distractions, that the internet will just flow, the session will just flow, and everyone will just have a wonderful and blessed time. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Oh, thank you, guys. It's so wonderful to be here. And... Um, just to say thank you to you, Melinda and Andrew, for this amazing ministry. I know it's still very new, and I know that God's going to have some incredible plans for this ministry. But um, just thank you for the opportunity today to just to have the platform just to share, share a bit with you all. And um, 
In preparation for today, I felt the need to just briefly share my testimony. I've been a business leader for over 20 years, initially starting my career as a financial planner and then later moving into management, leading teams in the financial services industry. I currently have been managing a discovery franchise for the past decade. I gave my life to Jesus in my early 20s, but I was a hypocritical Christian. I never had a relationship with Jesus. I never lived according to his word and his truth, but instead I lived in sin, completely separated from him. And it wasn't until three years ago when I had a supernatural encounter with Jesus that I experienced the truth of Jesus's love for me, of what repentance really means and his forgiveness. And that evening, three years ago, I was filled with the Holy Spirit. And he has been changing my life and sanctifying me ever since. So what is divine provision? And how have I come to see God's provision in my life and my business? Philippians 4.19 puts it very simply. My God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. We must be very careful as business leaders not to fall into the trap of prosperity seeking, always looking for money or possessions to miraculously arrive or to receive our own fame and fortune. We are anointed in business, not for our glory, but to further the kingdom of God. It will never be his plan if it is about elevating us for the glory. When I joined the corporate world as a financial planner, I did exceptionally well. Sales came very easy to me and there was never a shortage of money. But I fell into idolatry and quickly became defined by the world of sales, which was money, recognition, manipulation, and constant striving to be acknowledged and to receive the glory. And I thank Jesus for delivering me from that false identity. So let's take a closer look at what God desires to provide for us. Like any good parent, God would never give us what he knows would harm us. Yes, you hear many people in the business world who have this fear of failure. That is not from God. It is demonic. God will never give us a spirit of fear. And in fact, as a leader, we often have to fail and be brought to our knees in order for God to rid us of our pride, our greed, and our self-made glory so that God can help us develop into that Christ-likeness so that we can become, as it says in Matthew 5, the salt and light in our business. God does not want us to see him as this heavenly source of mere material possessions. Acquiring things is not the fundamental goal of this life. It says in Luke 12 verse 15, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in abundance of his possessions. God differentiates between our needs and our wants because he knows that where our treasure is, our heart is also. And when I was living my life for me, for Justine, my heart was wrapped up in the, in the glory of this world. And Jesus wants us to know that this world is not our home and that part of what we need is to shift our focus to the eternal while still living in this one. And so after I had my encounter with Jesus, he started to show me so many areas in my life and in my business that I needed to change. And it was about um, October that year, just after I had submitted all my paperwork to my accountant for her to prepare my tax return, that Jesus spoke very, very audibly to me. He said, Give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. 
And I sat in silence with this for only a very short while and realized what God was telling me to do. I had been dishonest with my tax return and I was claiming some expenses which should not have been claimed. I called my accountant and I advised her to remove these expenses and to recalculate my return without those expenses being taken into account. The result left me with a very large lump sum that I would have to pay back to SARS. And I had no idea where I would get that amount of money from. But I knew I had to be obedient and I had to trust God for that provision. So in December of that year, which was only about two months later, my franchise achieved a profit for that quarter. And the amount that I received as a profit share was exactly the amount that I had to pay to SARS. But that was not all. After receiving this profit, God also spoke audibly to me about tithing a certain amount of this. I did not know who he wanted me to give the money to, but I knew the exact amount that I had to give away. And it was probably, I can't remember, but it was probably about two days later, a very dear friend, someone who loves the Lord wholeheartedly, came to see me. And he was in a financial dilemma and needed money to help him through. And he was going to ask his employer for a loan. And he needed a certain amount, which happened to be the exact amount that God placed on my heart to tithe. And I knew this was who God wanted me to help. So when God blesses us financially, we should be using this provision to further the kingdom of God. So many of us judge our political leaders for being corrupt. Yet how honest are we with our tax returns or with the, or with the taxable income that we disclose? If we are dishonest in our tax returns, are we not also being corrupt? Are we not looking at the speck of sawdust in our leader's eyes, yet we have a plank in our own? How can we expect God to bless us and provide for us when we are being dishonest and not abiding by the law? Over the past few weeks while preparing for this, God has been speaking to me about Matthew 6 verse 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. I've seen this manifest in my business right through the pandemic. Business has been very hard, and times have been testing. Testing of character, testing of patience, and a big test of faith. But God's promise in our daily prayers is that he will provide our daily bread. He will do this. God does not lie. I held on to that promise. And if we are not experiencing his provision in our lives, then maybe we are not seeking his righteousness. Maybe we are seeking our own righteousness. And perhaps God needs to deal with our character first. Or maybe what we are asking him for is not according to God's will for our lives. Psalm 84, 11 states, no good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. This verse carries a reminder that there is a part we play in God's provision coming to fruition in our lives. We must walk uprightly. We must seek first his righteousness. And then when we do this, all these things will be added to our lives. So if provision is lacking, maybe we need to come into agreement with God's divine provision in our lives by doing our part. So if we look more closely at Matthew 6.33, there are two parts to the scripture. First, we need to seek the kingdom of God. How do we do this? What does this look like in our business? I'd like to just share some of the things that I focus on. 
I surround, well, I have surrounded myself with wise thinking partners. I believe it is very important to have someone who can give you biblical wisdom and wise counsel when needing to make decisions. I've walked closely with a very few wise individuals, one who happens to be my husband, who has helped me navigate the storms. Remember, iron sharpens iron. I've seen many times in my life that whatever I sow, I will reap. This not only applies to sowing goodness and kindness, but I have to also remind myself of this truth when I feel frustration or anger and I'm tempted to react in those emotions. I'm seeking daily to grow in intimacy with him, to know him. This time of intimacy can look very different to so many of us. I used to be so hard on myself when I, when I missed that morning quiet time and soon I fell into the striving and this religion. I'm not saying that a quiet time with Jesus is not important. In fact, I believe wholeheartedly that we all need to find time where we can go into that secret place and just worship on him. But why limit yourself to just that specific time of the day? A wise friend said to me, when you end a meeting or when someone leaves your office, Jesus is still there. He is with us 24-7. You can speak to him throughout the day. And so I speak to our Jesus throughout the day, asking him about certain decisions that need to be made, whether small or big, or sharing some exciting news, just showing him our gratitude throughout the day. This is how you feed relationships, and this is how you grow in trust and intimacy with Jesus. Having been delivered from a life of striving and worldly recognition, I have to be careful of falling into that temptation. And so I take, and so, sorry, so, so, so I try and make my life more of him and less of me. As, as it says in John 3, he must become greater and I must become less. I believe wholeheartedly that my divine provision is his righteousness. I run a weekly prayer meeting every Wednesday at work where we meet over Zoom and we pray for each other and we take communion together. It is probably the highlight of our week for those in the prayer meeting because we feel the presence of the Holy Spirit so strongly during that time. I also take communion regularly in my office on my own and I put my, blood, put my business under the blood of Jesus. The more you can do this, the better it will be for your business. Excuse me. I speak life over my business. It says in Proverbs 18 verse 21, that there's life and death in the power of the tongue. So I stay positive and I try to be a source of hope for those that I work with. I have the scripture, Proverbs 3, 5, verse 6 on my desk. Here it is right here. As my daily reminder to acknowledge him in all my ways and how I speak to people and how I dress and how I react to my emotions, even in how I answer an email, in everything within my business, I need to acknowledge him. For I know if I do this, he will direct my path. And so once we know how to seek the kingdom of God, then all these things will be added to us. So what does Jesus mean by all these things? If we look earlier in Matthew 3, we know that these things he's speaking about are our basic needs, our food, our water, our clothing. It is not about worldly wealth and riches. So during the lockdown, I had to remove many unnecessary things from my budget and I needed to make some cutbacks. But God provided all my needs according to his glory in Christ Jesus. Working in the sales industry for the past 20 years, I have seen so many people 
serve the God of this world because of their love of money. And while the God of this world can provide for all, all our fleshly desires and can give us all the riches of this world, so many of these people fall into the trap of wanting more and more. And I've seen so many become slaves to debt. It says in Matthew 6, verse 24, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And in 1 Timothy 6, verse 10, Paul says, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. And sadly, I have seen many people fall and lose their way because of this biblical truth. After I had my encounter with Jesus, that year I spent so much time at Jesus' feet in complete surrender while he changed me from the inside out and he healed me. The life that I knew was being rocked by a tornado of a storm. But God's divine provision is not just for our physical needs in life. His provision also refers to the needs of our soul and spirit, our inner man. And during that very rough year, I was blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ. I had such incredible faith and felt complete peace and sincere joy while I trusted wholeheartedly in God for the promise that he gave me in a vision that night of my encounter. So often as leaders, we hold on to these glorious prophetic words that have been spoken over our lives. Instead of seeking Jesus and hearing him, hearing from him directly, we live with hope deferred, waiting for these prophetic words to take shape. But God's provision in our lives will only be birthed when we take action, when we arise and shine and start seeking him and his righteousness. God provides a way for us to develop an intimate, conversational, obedient relationship with him so that we as business leaders can lead others into a Psalm 23 quality of life. When we have the Lord as our shepherd, we can say, I lack nothing. During that year of my encounter, God spoke to me about certain changes I needed to make in my personal life and in my business. Certain people I needed to remove from my life and certain things I needed to implement as a leader. God's hand was evidently on my business during this time that I'd just been seeking him above everything else. Days turned into weeks, weeks into months, and while the storms continued to rage, I lacked nothing, both in the physical and in the spiritual. I could see his handiwork taking shape, and all I could do was just surrender and obey. I surrendered everything to him, my life, my marriage, my business, and gave him full control. I learned that the more I trusted God, the more my faith grew. And what I did not know then, but I do now, is that without faith, it is impossible to please God. I had incredible faith during that time. For me, giving away control has never been easy. I live by my to-do lists, always trying to plan and control the outcome. But during this year, I gave everything over to God and I just followed. It was not always easy because I'm not a very patient person, but God delivered me through the storm. He is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. And to him, I give all the glory. Sometimes we have to get to the place 
where Jesus takes everything from us to know that he truly is enough. I often used to question my purpose and my calling, and at one stage even considered changing careers completely. Surely I could be doing something where I could be making more of an impact, something that was less stressful and more purpose-driven. But that was my own arrogance and pride, seeking the easy way out, seeking my own glory. Satan also opens doors in our lives, and so often we get tricked into taking the wrong path. What would happen if we all went off like self-made heroes, trying to do more without even having made a godly impact in the current place that God has placed us? We, as business leaders, have all been called to lead for a time such as now. And bringing the kingdom of heaven to our business is our purpose and calling and God's divine provision in our lives. He will equip us for this. He will give us all we need, whether it be finances or spiritual equipping, to further his kingdom. God can do anything through a person who is fully surrendered and sanctified. Being a leader does not mean we will be popular. I've had to have some very difficult conversations with people while in leadership, as it is my kingdom duty to bring the darkness to light, but doing so in love. God equipped me with the courage and the strength to do this, being able to stand for the truth, even when you know it won't make you popular. As mentioned, I have my favorite scripture on my desk as a daily reminder just to trust in him with all my heart and not to lean on my own understanding. I know we have all prayed for things in our business that have not come to pass. James 4 verse 3 is an answer to our questions about why prayers sometimes go unanswered. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. God sees the heart and our prayers, motivations are important to him. When I was blinded by the world and serving my own glory, I would pray for my own worldly desires. And it is not that God does not want to bless us with that. So he does not, not that he does not want to give us the worldly wealth or recognition. Sometimes we need this to further his kingdom, but he looks at the attitude of our hearts. Joseph had all of Egypt's wealth, but Joseph had to get his heart right before he was given the riches of the world. And there was no denying which master he served, even when he had all of Egypt's wealth. And speaking about Joseph and his wealth, as a financial planner, I have believed that building your financial plan on the rock, which is with strong biblical principles, you will see God's provision in your life. If we ever do have an opportunity, Melinda and Andrew, I would love to invite someone from my team to share this biblical truth with all of us. He has built his financial planning practice on these very strong principles. And this is how he advises all his clients. And so friends, in closing, I read the other day that God is concerned with every part of our being, our spirit, soul, and body. His goodness and character is infinite. So the ways he provides for us are beyond anything we can ask or imagine. We can trust his goodness, his guidance, and his shepherding care to do more for us than we could ever achieve on our own. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you so much, Justine. Um, I was very blessed by that. And um, wow, you know, I on this journey and 
I can just hear how God is transforming you and changing you into a powerhouse in the kingdom. And so I'll be alongside you, boy, cheering you on, and vice versa. And, and just, I love what you said about intimacy. You know, everything is born out of our relationship with the Lord. Every area of our life is about cultivating that relationship with him, you know. And um, I, I went through a similar thing last year. Just, uh, it's been such a transformative time, especially during COVID and the lockdown last year of trusting God completely, not trying to control everything, uh, control free. You know, he's changing us. He's transforming us. It was very, very powerful. Thank you so much, my friend. Welcome to everyone else who's joined. Um, we're now going to move straight on to Dean. Um, who's going to be sharing with us. Thank you, Dean. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Thanks, Justine. That was um, enlightening and full of Holy Spirit, which is the main thing we want, hey? Amen. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, as many of us are on us, I think it's 26 or whatever, we've probably all got an opinion on divine provision. And if I ask each person what they thought divine provision means, I'm sure I'll get 26 answers. Um, so I wanted to just take a look at trying to define what exactly divine provision is. Because most people, when you talk to them, especially even Christian businessmen, are, are concerned about accumulation of wealth. They're concerned about prestige. They're concerned about a whole bunch of things. And, and, and they, they're working from a very unsettled heart. Uh, that when you're listening, uh, you're picking up that um, yes, the angle. So perhaps I can stimulate some thinking today. Um, it's really impossible, though, to cover the whole of divine provision with just two people speaking. So I bet you think, how much do I broad brush? How much do I fill in with a little bit of a, you know, finer detail? And I've tried to kind of mix it up a little. Um, there, there are kind of four points that I really want to address. Um, Justine conducted uh, or covered a, a part, of, part of the area. This whole thing is focused on our relationship. Divine providence is our relationship. The development of our relationship with God, the development of our communication with God. Um, and as we follow later, you'll see from Abraham's life, the first call of God on our life is not the full picture. We only get the full picture if we begin to walk with him and we begin to be obedient to the mandate that's on our life, then every time we meet with God, he begins to take out his notepad and say, oh, yes, in addition to, this is also what I'm about to do with you or for you or through you. So I'll hopefully get to that. Um, okay, so most people have a little mental picture of what divine providence means. And then they measure their life against this picture. And, and then they either are meeting the measure or they're not. And so we have these little goals and objectives and all these little things that we believe that if I do those things, then I'm going to feel satisfied. I'm going to feel like I've arrived. I'm actually doing, you know, I'm doing well now. Um, so that measure unfortunately becomes a stick on our back because when we're not measuring up, we feel like God abandoned us. We feel like we walk in this road alone and, and suddenly our picture of providence is out the window. We no longer think that we're prospering. And um, that is actually not the truth. So if we actually think about divine providence and the satisfaction of it, then it's actually an independent thing. It doesn't have a system of measures. It doesn't have a system of goals and objectives. And it's simply based and flows out of our relationship to the Lord. If we are securing God, then we are unshakable and unmovable by circumstance. It doesn't actually matter. 
we're not running back into the office and screaming at God or crying like babies and saying, God, why have you abandoned me? It's gone silent in you. I'm now in a famine and I don't know where you are and I'm going to have to sell my wife to Pharaoh because I need to make a bit of bucks, right? That's a bit of humor in case you didn't get it, but know that uh, Abe sold his wife out two times and came away a bit richer. But, but yeah, so let's, if I can define the way I understand divine prosperity. Divine prosperity, sorry, I'm gonna to have to read it, is a gift bestowed upon us. In other words, it's something God gives to us. It's a gift. He gives it to us, divine prosperity. And it manifests as a disposition created by our level of faith from time to time. So last year, my faith level in prosperity was here. This year, it's here. Or well, now it's here. Hopefully by next year, it's somewhere else. It's shifted. It's no longer restless. It's no longer thinking I don't have it. It's settled. I've reached that position in my, my faith that the matter of prosperity is settled. And it doesn't matter whether I have a little bit or I have a lot. I'm still the same in my relationship to the Lord. I still believe that whatever he has said to me will come to pass. That's how it is. Okay, so... The strength or weakness of our trust in God indicates whether or not our soul life is anchored. If my soul life goes up and down, if my emotions go up and down, or my thinking pattern goes up and down, or my, or my feelings or senses are being shifted by different circumstances, then I am not prospering. Doesn't matter how much money I've got. Because one little swoop, one little enemy that comes against my business will shake me. One little change in the, in the macro circumstances will change me. Because now all of a sudden we've been in business like this for 20 years, but suddenly the macro environment changes and I'm shaken. My prosperity isn't real. It's a fabrication. It was based on shaky ground. So the prosperous soul is the soul that's anchored. He knows who his savior is. He knows where his provision comes from, or she. So Hebrews 11, verse 11, deals with Sarah. And it says this, Sarah's faith embraced God's miracle power to conceive, even though she was barren and past the age of childbearing. For the authority of her faith rested in the one who made the promise. Listen to this. She tapped into his faithfulness. That's where prosperity is. It rests in God alone. It doesn't rest in us. He has to download that to us as a gift. So while I'm here, let me just say this. This week I had a dream. Interesting dream. I grew up on the Durban beachfront. And I knew where the sea line is. I knew where we surfed, I knew where the cars parked. And when I got there, the sea had moved. It was now up where the car park was. And the whole coastline, all the way down to South Beach, the sea was further up the land. And the funny thing is there were no waves. There was nobody surfing. The water was just lapping on the shore like a lake. And I woke up thinking, well, God, what are you saying? And I want to tell you this. God has shifted the coastline. Everything that we were used to in terms of government, in terms of business, has shifted. God has shifted it sovereignly. At the macro level, he's changed it. And, and again, it gets to our prosperity. Are we ready as Christian businessmen to exploit the new opportunities that are coming our way? Or are we sitting bemoaning our faith because things have changed? Or are we saying, God, you've shifted me to a foreign country. You've shifted me like Abraham to give me a promised land that I actually never saw coming. I've been so used to operating on this level, like Justine was saying. And yet, God, you're calling me to a miraculous work. You're calling me to something new. You're calling me to take my plow out and plow new fields. And so this is the situation we're in. 
And God has accelerated this training of us and put us under extreme pressure, extreme pressure, so that the truth of his word can be shaped in us, can be formed in us, and we can once more believe. We can say, God, I'll put my trust in you, even though it looks barren out there, and even it looks like I'm beyond the age and some opportunities have been taken away from me. You are putting brand new opportunities in front of me, brand new. If I'll just open my eyes and if I'll just put my trust back in you and I'll begin to hear your voice again. This is where we are. Okay, so Jesus said this. He said, my prosperity. Some of you might find it reading peace, but the word is the same. He says, my prosperity, I'll leave with you. In other words, he's bestowing it upon us. My prosperity, I give to you. So peace is an inward condition. It's in our inner life. It's not external. Peace is not external. It's inward. You have to have peace in yourself. In other words, you're not moved by, by external issues. Your peace can't be shaken. So, so Jesus is saying peace and prosperity, they relate to. They're the same thing. If I go over time, shout the right wave. <laughs> I might get passionate. Okay, so, and then he goes on to say, which is what Justine was saying, not as the world gives you. So his peace or his prosperity doesn't look like the world. In fact, often it's juxtaposed to the world. They doing the stuff that you were talking about, having to be honest and righteous and all those things. They doing the other stuff because that's what their goals are. So the thing that Jesus gives us never shifts. Never, ever. God's immovable. He doesn't shift. He doesn't change his opinion. It's different. The way we conduct our lives under God's prosperity is completely in, uh, different. So, and, 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 and you touched it. Jesus says this, let not your heart be troubled, worried, anxious, Neither let it be afraid. So when we are afraid, it means his peace is not on us. It means I'm not prospering. It means I'm scared. It means I've moved out of the realm of his blessing and I've moved into my own righteousness, my own understanding, my own strength. That's where I'm at. And that's why I'm panicking. Because if you're anything like me, you go, I don't have it. <laughs> I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to fix it. I haven't got the brains or the IQ or whatever else it was required, but I don't have it. Anyway, so that's exactly why we were chosen by God, so that we could lean on what he gives us. Uh, our Apostle John says this, he says, and he's writing to somebody he knows, and he's clearly a businessman. So he goes, beloved friend, I pray that you are prospering in every way, in every way. In every way. And that you continuously enjoy good health. Just as your soul is prospering. He nails it right there. You see, when your soul is prospering, you are prospering. Then you're not moved by the, by the vagrancies of life. You're not moved by anything that can shake you. You remain solidly attached to the relationship you have with the Lord. That is, that is what we get from God. So... Peace, therefore, is an inward frame of mind. Its scope is our inner life. Your emotions, your thinking, your senses and feelings. They recognize the enduring nature of the one who makes the promises. Hebrews 6, 13 to 19. And then we endure until the promise has been realized. Despite the opposition that comes. We all know if you get a promise from God, if I speak a prophetic word to you, everything will go backwards in appearance because the words are going to be contested for and you need to stand up and contest for it. It will not happen unless you start the journey. It will not happen if like Abraham, you don't get on your horse and pack your goods up and put your wife on the camel or whatever it is and you start to the place where God said, 
So obedience and sacrifice, the things that we don't like, Justine was talking about having to make sacrifices in her life that were costly and painful. To be obedient to the mandate on her life. And so the second main thing is, okay, we've got this inner peace. So what about the mandate? When God deals with Adam, he provides provision in the garden. He says, you can eat here. Just pick whatever and eat. Divine providence. But the garden was not just providence. It was the place of the business meeting. It was the place where God came to have fellowship or speak business with Adam about the mandate he was given. So yeah, they are walking in the garden, chatting. You know, not saying, hello, Adam, how are you? How's your wife? I'm sure he did that. But I'm sure he was, how's your mandate going? What are you doing protecting the garden? What is the state of affairs on earth? So relationship, again, is the big one. When God begins to provide provision, it's also the place where he wants to talk to you because it's also the place of his instruction to you. It's also the place where he develops your intimacy with him, where he develops the relationship. So when we watch Abraham's walk with him, we find out he first has a vision. Well, it says the word of the Lord came to him. Maybe somebody spoke to him. Don't know. Not very clear. But he received a message and he followed it. But as you read through his life, you'll see that the relationship with God develops. God begins to trust him more. He begins to trust God more. And of course, he makes mistakes. And when the wind blows a bit hard, he shakes a bit. But he develops his relationship. And so, you know, I think it's Exodus 17 or 16, I can't remember, it might be 16. We hear that God was with him in person. Actually, no longer in a dream, no longer in a vision, he was speaking to him face to face because it ends with this expression, God rose up from him. It's almost like the word used for rapture. God rose up, lifted up. So he was standing there having this conversation with Abraham about Isaac and about Ishmael. Because Abraham was saying, no, 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 let Ishmael live. And God's going, no, 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 no. I will let him live. But the promise is on your seed, your seed. Isaac, that will be the fulfillment of the promise. And then God lifts up for him. The next chapter, we read Abraham sitting in the tent. And he sees three men approaching. And so he knows who they are. He knows it's the Lord. So he rushes around, tells them to sit down. I'll make a meal for you. And here's the interesting thing. As the Lord is leaving, he says to his two companions, which are, we assume, angels. Because they're the angels that go to Sodom. God says, shall I not disclose to Abraham what I'm about to do? Is he not a trustworthy guy? He has... He, has, he comments about Abram's character. So in other words, over this whole list of interactions, God had been looking at Abram and saying, let's see if I can trust this guy. Let's see how far is our relation go. And now he's at the place where he's boasting on Abram. He's telling the guys, Abram's a good guy. Because the relationship has developed. And so you get, this, you get this development of relations, but you also get every time they interact. Not only does the interaction deepen, but their friendship deepens, and so does the mandate. So does the divine providence grow. First, it's the dust of the earth. Next, it's all the stars in the sky. Every single time, there's this growth. Divine providence is about the growth of our trust in God and about him trusting us. Because we can go, oh, God knows the end from the beginning. Yes, he does. But in real time, we are being tested to see, do we stand? Do we desire him? Is our heart for him? And that's providence. When we're in that place, nothing shakes us. We, it, you can't be shaken. So 
you know, I may not be actually addressing the things that God wants, but but Holy Spirit wants to unlock in our hearts an understanding that it's all about him. It's all about us. It's all about us two coming together and being friends so that 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 God is boasting on you in heaven, that he, that he can go. Do you see my servant, Belinda? Have you seen her? Have you seen her character? Have you seen how faithful she is? Look at her. In all those testings in her business, look at her standing. She's still got the shield of faith up. She hasn't dipped it yet. She cries at times. <laughs> the wind blows strong on her at times. And she'll call me and go, hey, Dean. <laughs> you know. But two days later, keel is right and she's sailing again. The wind of the spirit is in herself. And yes, of course, that's all of us. But, but this journey is what it's about. Provision is a journey. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to shoot to this one last point I want to make because I probably spoke too much there, but it's fine. God told Abraham, you will be a blessing to all the families of the earth. And the line above that, he says, I will bless you and make you famous and you will be a blessing to others. I think Justine touched on it. The blessing of God is a river. It's a conduit. It doesn't stop at you. The prosperity of the world is all about me, 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 me. Maybe my family. But God isn't like that. God gave his son for everyone so that everyone who believed on him and received him could become children of God. God has got an expansive heart. And so he doesn't expect us to, to represent us, to represent him without the blessing flowing through us. And so I'm going to ask you guys some questions because I don't know how much thinking you've done on this. What does it mean to be a blessing to the nations or to the families of the earth? Now, all of you in business probably only think as, as far as blessing people you produce for you. You reward their production. And that's the basis of your blessing. I want to push you further and say, it doesn't stop there. It does not. We are not just meant to reward productivity. That is not being a blessing. That is paying somebody the due wages. God gives us far more than just what we do. He blesses us way beyond any measure we can even think or imagine. So here's a question. The values you have and the desires you have, do you know what your staff's desires and values are? Do you? Do you know the costs associated with them giving you your production? Do you? It's not just about being fair. Malachi deals with fairness. And it angers God if we are unjust. But I'm not even there. I'm saying, do we understand truly what it means to bless the other families of the earth? So do you randomly bless a staff member on their birthday? Do you randomly bless them if, it's, if they've done nothing? Does it cross our minds to even think about that call to be a blessing? to be a conduit. Really? I don't know. And, and that's what I'm trying to stimulate today, to say, guys, when you're in business, do you show generosity? Do you? There are people here, Melinda, very generous. Invested in a dream for me. Paid for me to go to Zambia. That's the generosity of God. That means in this place, Melinda's prospering. She's understanding the prosperity of God. You know, I've got another friend. I won't mention his name because I didn't speak to him. I, I mentioned Melinda's name because I asked him. He invests in people's dreams. When he has their dream, he goes, hey, can I invest in it? Now, you know, it's not a hundred million rand dream. 
Maybe it's a cow. He bought a cow for a guy who just bought a farm. You know, maybe it's um, somebody who whose lack of, of finance can't get them to get their skill to do your a better job at your. But he does things like that. Now, to me, that's the generosity of God. That somebody is thinking, how do I bless the families of the earth? How am I more than just accumulating for myself? So I realize this is not all the thinking that needs to be done on the matter, but I'm asking you to think about it. I'm asking you to take it to the Lord and say, Lord, how do I fulfill this mandate? Because I can't outgive you. And lastly, there's a guy that I know, I won't mention his name, you know, frequents a certain restaurant. So one day he goes to the restaurant and he says, Mr. Manager, I'd like to bless all your staff. Can I do it? I says, yes. So he takes a financial gift. He gives it to all the waiters. Not a tip, just a blessing. He walks out the restaurant. His phone beeps. 25,000 US dollars into his account. Same day, one minute after. So... Are we representing truly God? Is our faith placed in God? And are we, are we demonstrating the life that he gives us, the blessing that he gives us? Now, I didn't say any of this to shame you because I'd love to give you my little ones. But I'm sadly having to grow my faith in this area. But I've met people, Melinda and others, who in this place, show they understand divine providence. They're, they're not just thinking about their needs and trying to, you know, store us for the rainy day. They're actually going, and I'm not talking about not financial planning, right? Don't get that. <laughs> you, need, you, need, you need to financially plan, right? Grow your herds. That's a good godly thing. However, I am saying in a way that our mind thinks, do we think about blessing? Do we think about what opportunities we have to bless people, to see a need and to address it. And uh, otherwise we transactional. You do this for me, I pay you so much. Great. <laughs> you are blessing the world slowly, <laughs> maybe. Guys, I, I, I guess that might challenge you. And I want to close on that. But I do want to say, The Lord is completely and utterly gutting everything we ever knew. He is gutting it completely. And if we don't have an unshakable relationship to the Lord, then providence is just striving. It's just the restlessness of our soul that's trying to accomplish things with our own human strength. And eventually we burn out completely because there is only so much that we can do. It has always been dependent upon him. He sets the garden, he sets the mandate, and we are always comfortable. I'll close with this because you said it, Justin. John the Baptist realized that his mandate ended when Jesus Christ was baptized. That was his mandate. He was told to reveal Jesus to Israel. After that, he said, I must decrease. He must increase. And that happens in many parts of our life in business. There are areas where we must decrease and we must give the thing up. Give it up and walk away from it. Not try to blow life into it out of ourselves, our earthly lungs. So, guys, I, I hope that this was helpful in some way. I hope I didn't take too long. Um, yeah, bless you, man. I, um, I really enjoyed sharing today. Do I mute myself again? Yeah, wow. Um... Jeez, uh, I must just say that I've been, and I'll firstly just, just thank you to Dean and Justine because yeah. I've been, and I hope I don't offend anyone, but 
tough. There's so much flakiness at the moment that's going on out there. So to Dean and Justine, thank you for, for, for true godly authenticity. You can actually feel the love of God coming through it. And people say, how can you hear the love of God come through harsh words? I'm saying, because you're not listening, because you have a hard heart. So I want to say bless you guys, because truly, the word of God, Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace. You know, and I, and I really firmly believe in these last days, we must stay away from the fluff. We must stay away from these feel-good things that like, oh, no, prosperity, brother, bless you, sister. The word of God is a sharp sword. So bless you. That was fantastic. Um, yeah, Dean, bless you, man. I just, uh, I'm, I'm, I don't know, I'm speechless. So I'm going to shut up now because I'm still processing this so much. There's just, and Justine, I mean, I really feel like crying now because I can still feel the thought that what God spoke to you, the, the, the love. So bless you, God. Linda, I'm going to shut up now because I'm about to cry buckets here. I just feel the love of God came right through those two. And uh, that's, what, that's what the world needs. We need true authenticity. We need true godly words speaking to our hearts and putting us on the right track. So bless you guys. Melinda, over to you. Um, I'm going to go. Uh, for, certainly, oh, it's just such a wonderful reminder. Um, and what was very evident for both of you was just about our relationship with the Lord. And I, and I have to say, I, I needed some of those reminders, you know. And um, you know, the last few weeks have been like, you know, and uh, um, oh, just reminding me that God is our source and not to look in the natural and to just go back into that place of his steadfastness, you know, it all comes out of that relationship, our relationship with him. And um, yeah, we all a work in progress and we all need each other. And it's just really awesome. I was very, very blessed by that, Dean. Thank you, my friend. Um, I'd like to um, just to open up now to the group. Is there anyone on this group or any business people or anyone who's thinking about um, why do you start a business who just needs a bit of prayer or um, are we just going to allow the Holy Spirit to flow in terms of any prophetic unctioning or encouragement? So um, if you would like prayer or um, trusting God for just some direction, then just unmute yourselves or um, you, you will just put up your hand so that we can just allow you to, to ask what you need to ask. Okay, Dwayne. We go, Dwayne. Thank you so much. And also thank you for pronouncing my name correctly because usually people get that wrong. <laughs> um, Pleasure. <laughs> yeah, look, I've, um, a short while ago, well, maybe not too short, I, I started a, um, well, I didn't realize it was going to become a woodworking business. Um, I spent five years in a, in a desert and um, yeah, it's just God came through in a massive way after that time period. Um, you know, it just brought me through a lot of um, a very deep depression and all that type of thing. And um, yeah, slowly but surely things developed and you know i started with a few pallets people some people dropped off some pallets i made a few things and slowly um there were some people that um, bought me some power tools brand new at the box and as time went on people bought me even more so i'm equipped to a certain degree and i can do quite a lot of those things um but it's still obviously very young and at a small stage, still a very small business. Um, bringing business in has been, has been a big challenge for me. Obviously my, my marketing skills and the amount of finance available to, to extend that has been quite difficult. Um, someone recently helped me with an animation and with, a, with an awesome logo. I mean, God has blessed me so much um, in, in, in that regard. But bringing more, more business in where I can actually sustain something, um, you know, even just putting food on the table um, where I can um, give something to this 
a family that's um, taken me in. And um, yeah, but God's witness to me has been awesome. And to hear what has been spoken today, it's just so massively confirms everything in my heart on, on many different levels and even taking it further. So yeah, I, I really need prayer for more work to come in. Um, uh, provision on various levels in, in the small business that is now formed. Um, and then obviously taking it forward from here. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> cool, cool. I think let's let's put them on the parking yeah. list. So Chris uh, for Dwayne. Uh, and then yeah. Okay, I think Wes, you put a hand up there. You want to put my hand and up? Then I'm my hand you also up. got Dawn and El Dean. If I pronounce correct, you got hands up. I think you two are next then. So I think Wes, if you want to pray, go for it. But yeah, I've got a bit of a testimony. You're to put your hand up. Be very brief. Can you hear me? Yeah. Sorry, my internet connection might be terrible. Hello. Yeah, go for it. All right. So yeah, I think can you, you know the one scene that we I can I, hear I, you, Miss. Okay, good. So I live on a farm, and funny enough, it's called Eden Rock Farm, and I want to speak a bit on that. Um, I was born into two faiths: uh, Mauritian Catholic, and uh, Blood Rock Germany, where my grandfather was a church elder, and I've attended church every Sunday, twice a Sunday since I was born, um, up until he passed, and. Josie knows me, she knows my faith in the Lord, and she knows where I come from, and she's helped me gratefully um, transition from one business to the next. And I just feel, I just need to mention, you know, I mean, the whole idea and the understanding that everyone mentions, the house of God and, and the Garden of Eden and, and Adam eating the fruit, you know, relating to business. Um, I'm a farmer. Um, financial planner now, thanks to a very, very great Christian man who got me involved 15 years ago and, 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 and gave me a career. And, and we all know the gospel of the, the, the fish, so I won't mention it. Um, for me, you know, the whole idea of um, looking for faith, looking for God, losing our way, um, we all know, and, and I'm going to be brief, guys, I just feel I need to say this. Um, Revelation 3.20, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If you open the door, I'll come to you. And I will sup with you and you with me. Um, my grandfather being a church elder, often we'd speak. Um, he passed a few years back. Uh, he, he strengthened my faith a lot. Um, not in the way uh, of his faith, because I had to find my own way. He was very staunch. Um, and um, the French side of the family were not. <laughs> they were Catholic. So I had to find my own way. And and it was a, a turmoil internally. I mean, who do I go to? I went to a church school, Anglican church school. Um, I had the gospel read to me every day, and um, I enjoyed it. Then I lost my faith. I lost my way. Uh, depression, attempted suicide, and drugs, you name it. And then I found my way again. And, and that's why I've just got to, if you don't mind, I'll share one more scripture with you. And it's my grandfather's favorite scripture. And we mentioned Corinthians, and it seems to be, the verse that most people go towards, um, whether it be weddings, funerals, etc. But um, this is a farmer, uh, born and bred. I'm third gen. Uh, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for the food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. And those words have stood strong with me because the bounty of the Lord, uh, when we share, um, during the rioting and the looting, I had the privilege and the honor of distributing food packages with friends um, going through these roadblocks into tumultuous situations and places. And it was a blessing to just see uh, husbands and wives and children just grateful for, for a tray of eggs. I mean, that's basically what we were delivering. And um, honestly, thank you for today. I really, really got a lot from it. And I hope I can come back and, and just participate, really. Thank you. Yeah, cool. Thanks very much, Wes. Um, 
I, I think there's no unlimited terms of RSVPs. Anyone's invited anytime to, to, to join. So more than welcome. Yeah. Uh, there was a hand from Dawn as well. So I think Dawn, if you want to go for it. Sure. Let me put my video on so you can see my face. Hi, everybody. Oh, oh John. Oh, Ayanda. Oh, Kassonde. Unjani. Unjani Mfuetus. I just hope Ayanda is still here. Right, my story is very brief. For the past 12 years, I was contracted by the Xenex Foundation and worked in Ilembe in a very deep rural context. I am a changed woman. Um, I honestly feel there needs to be a lot more conversation had between our brothers and sisters of color. It's been quite intimidating for me sitting here looking at all your white faces because I've only dealt with Isizulu people. That's all I have had for the past 12 years of my life. The CEO um, in KZN that represents Zenex is, is white, but he's all over the place. All my colleagues were Isizulu speaking, so Ndiakaluma Isizulu, and my Zulu names Nomusa Mkiz. However, end of Jan, I felt that it was time to move on and I registered with Sakwa, I have become fully accredited to run the NBC. It's the new venture creation qualification. And brothers and sisters in Christ, this is to train our youth to become entrepreneurs. Oh, now I'm going to start. And I'm battling to find funding. I've had my line in the water. I have been to the CETAs. I have contacted numerous people, bar Trevor Noah. But he's more into high school um, education and funding, as is Oprah Winfrey. And I would definitely email them. But the, the NVC is a little bit more tricky because it's, it's youth from 18 to, to 35. And it's 30% theory, 70% practical, where we organize mentors for them, take in a cohort of 20, and train our youth to make their own reign. You have no idea what it's like out in Ilembe. My brothers of color will know. The unemployed youth, people, there's work to be done. I ask you to stand with me in prayer that there will be a breakthrough uh, financially so that I can sponsor these youth. They'll need a stipend and they'll need transport money. And they'll need money for their assessing and moderating of the... Um, POEs, and I will need to pay lecturers because I can I can do the communication side, but not maths and science. That's not my forte. So please, thank you. That's all I have to say. Cool. Thank you, Dawn. We got that down for a prayer point as well. Um, I think Aldine, you had your name up. If I pronounce your name right. Yes, Aldine. Thank you so much. This is my first meeting, so I'm very excited to be with you all. I jumped on late because I had another work meeting. So I shared on this group last night, it was the opening ceremony of the Dubai Expo. I don't know if anyone watched, but it was without a doubt the most profound, amazing, incredible, artistic, uh, eventing, uh, better than Olympics or anything I've ever seen. And the reason why I um, LinkedIn involved, etc., was um, someone from Saudi Arabia at the end of last year asked me to bring an actual real Zulu wedding to the expo. The proper couple who want to get married and will get married there. And the uh, idea was to break a Guinness Book of Records to have a tribal wedding within uh, an international space. They've got 172 countries. And in one day, the uh, number of tourists that would pass through would make it the biggest number of guests. And it was a massive, massive, massive budget that we would have had even gifts for every single person who traveled through. And we were going to run it over about three days. And I had quoted to take 100 people from Durban. Um, I had a project manager for every 10 people because it might for some people have been the first time that they actually leave the country. And we needed to be slick and sharp because if you do want to go back and watch the ceremony from last night, you will see we're talking every single 
thing they have done is Guinness Book of Records standard. They obviously have the wealth there and they very much don't mind spending lots of money. Now, as you can imagine, unfortunately due to COVID, uh, to get 100 South Africans all right and ready outside of the budget with all the vaccinations and the possible um, people who might actually be contracted, they actually shut the door on the project, which is fine because I had made the contacts and I'd actually pitched seven other projects, all of which also got, let's not say cancelled, postponed because Expo is all the way until the end of March. It's a six month uh, business, cultural, science, sub sustainable um, uh, world uh, platform. But the reason why I wanted to ask for prayer is one of the ideas that I pitched, it was actually uh, an idea they were least interested in. It was focused on children and focused on global adversity that kids have faced, number one, due to COVID, due to isolation. But then you add in natural disasters. You can use South Africa as an example. We've had riots. And then the average issues that children have, like self-worth issues, skin color issues, body image issues, bullying is huge. The Arab world with 400 million Arabs have the biggest amount of bullying of kids at schools. Uh, that's what my research and contacts have shown. And I basically pitched that they have life-size mascots. Now, don't forget, I'm Christian and I'm dealing with mostly Muslim people. My mind is kingdom and every idea I pitched had kingdom uh, concept and wording, just never using Jesus or, or, I mean, they're happy with the word God, but not Jesus. But the kingdom mindset behind this idea was that we would have life-size, I mean, uh, bigger than life-size mascots that would literally represent, you could call it the fruits of the spirit, uh, but I just said to them, positive mindset, um, and these these mascots would be there for six months, and every kid coming through, they would have like an agenda of pantomime, music, plays, where they would talk about, they would be, um, these mascots would be like superheroes, Miss Peace, Mr confidence um, and Mr. Um, assertive, um, literally all the fruits of the spirit from a Christian standpoint, but every other positive aspect of self-worth that kids would be struggling with. And my pitch was to use it as a, a bringing together of cultures, because as I say, there are 172 countries represented. And that was pretty much, I mean, it was a very detailed document. Anyway, um, when all the other projects were parked, I assumed this one was too. And when I went onto the website about three weeks ago, my idea has actually been used literally word for word. For, it's in all the publications from the Gulf News to the Expo official site to the government official um, press websites. So I'm going over not to fight, not to beg, not to plead, but with a kingdom mindset to go over. And I mean, I'm a, I'm a woman from the West. I'm dealing with um, a, a Muslim culture. You, you can understand what the view of women uh, in general is. But because I carry Christ, I'm going over and I will be contacting my um, the guy that I've been dealing with for six months. With um, I'm going to go to Expo first and I'm going to look and see exactly to what level of detail my idea and maybe some of the other ideas have been used. And then I'm going to contact him and say, can we please have, I do have family there, so I will not be on my own, but can we have a meeting because I'd love to invoice because I'm so incredibly honored that a South African can have such an amazing platform, their idea used for six months that the whole world is going to see and so approach it from that perspective and by that stage I would have worked out what my invoice should be so obviously it's a huge feat it's a huge um but God has put this this joy into my heart I haven't felt upset I haven't felt aggrieved I've just felt huge joy that um I, uh, I have this opportunity and obviously to minister if that should be the case but it's dangerous territory and um I just felt like if I've got people backing me I leave in three weeks 
and that yeah that that god's will will prevail ultimately i don't have to stand in judgment and i believe that there will be possibly many other business opportunities because they're business people from all around the world that are going to be there so that's me in a snapshot Yes, um, Aldine, I, I was just as you were sharing, and it's all incredibly exciting. You know, God turned something negative into something positive. And um, I really do believe he's positioning you there for a reason. You think you're going there for that, but there's yeah. going to be other opportunities for you. I just see that. Um, you. So this has all happened for a reason, and God's in control, you know. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I just, I just pray that trip is successful that you are impactful um god goes before you he makes every crooked path straight and um that you come back connections and new contact and um yeah, that it's going to be a very very fruitful trip for you um, thank you thank but there's you. a plan in place just one more thing uh, I'd i really look forward to hearing your feedback Thank you, because the idea, they were so excited about the idea about taking it from Expo and, and putting it into schools and taking it on a road show. So if that lands up being something I bring back and actually implement here, as you say, or meet somebody else from Europe or Australia that's interested, at least I know that it's my idea and they know it's my idea. So I know God will somehow work his future plan for me in terms of business because I've been in advertising for 30 years and I I don't want to do traditional advertising anymore this is something that I just feel is my you know children adversity it's my own personal testimony so um, thank you for that confirmation Melinda I look forward to reporting back can I add something please yeah. thank you Dean you know Melinda has this, has this wonderful vision of a fruit tree where the fruit is ripe. And you know, as you were talking, um, it's like there are five trees there in your garden. And the word of the Lord is this, whichever tree ripens first, pick the fruit. So there's five projects, let's say. Well, you didn't give a yeah. number, but let's say there's yeah. five projects. Yes. You will see which fruit ripens first. And, and in other words, keep your eyes open Yes. And then when the when the fruit ripens on the tree, pick it. Yes, exactly. Without my own agenda, like trusting God and he will show the way. Yeah, Correct. I love that. Thank you. Thanks, Dean. Um, also, Dwayne, um, just when you were sharing, um, I just prophetically picked up, gosh, you have such a heart for the Lord, seeking truth and he's done such a tremendous work in you. And um, I just love that carpentry. I mean, Jesus was a carpenter, you know. And um, uh, just, I, I just see you, oh, you just carry his heart for, for ministry and salvation and um, for evangelists. You're evangelizing. You're telling people about him. Um, so, you know, that's first and foremost your calling. And then you happen to have this skill and trade, you know, in carpentry. So I'm quite excited for you and to see how, you know, what God does with you. And um, he's going to provide all of those things because, in fact, he's done all that already. I mean, look what he's helped you set up his business. And um, so you're going to be busy. Jeez, I see you hamming away in your workshop there. So that's a done deal. And of more importance and more impact is what you're going to have in the kingdom. Um, just speaking to people about your life. And I know nothing about you, but I know there's a story there. Incredible adversity and how you've uh, God has just brought you through that. Yeah. You know, and, and to this point. And your story that he knows about is so incredibly powerful to help the people. So, you know, it's like the two are going to run in tandem, your ministry and the business, and your business is going to open up opportunities for ministry, and ministry is going to open up opportunities for business. So there's just this incredible story that God has written about your life. 
and uh, we look forward to hearing about more of that. And provision has been made. It's all in your orchard. The trees are laden. It's just your trees are laden with fruit. You know? And let's just remember what Justine and Dean shared today. It's just in that place of relationship with him. We yeah. can cultivate that relationship. You know, the, it, when God drops something into your spirit, when God tells you something, when God reveals something to you, you become unshakable. It doesn't matter what other people say. And uh, he's just drawing you into that relationship. All of us, more and more of that. Because out of that place, when we know we've been in his presence, where we leave that place and we smell of him and we carry his anointing, we are so empowered. Yeah. I have gone to that place sobbing because I felt like, oh, I just can't cope. I can't do it. What am I going to do? This finance is talking. And I spend time with him and we lay it all at his feet and we, he revives our spirits and we leave there feeling empowered and carrying his authority to do all that he's called us to do because we are more than conquerors. Yeah. Praise God. Woo! Thank you. That Thank you. was very, very, um, very accurate word that I actually, I actually, it felt like you actually knew me <laughs> or, or if someone gave you like a, a short book. I don't know, but there is ministry. And I started when I left school, I, I went and I studied a little bit of theology. Um, my dad was a pastor. Um, I gave my Dwayne, life. Can I ask age. you not to, sorry, Dwayne, can I ask you not to say anything more? A dean just wants to share before you tell us too much. Yeah. About your personal story you want to share, Dean? Before he gives the game up, eh? Yeah. <laughs> Dwayne, you know, there's a scripture that says, do not despise the day of small beginnings. And, you know, it's an interesting, you were talking and I saw a picture of a nail going into wood when you were talking. And, you know, it speaks about this is a time where you need to be meticulous and you need to be precise. You know, carpenter, obviously you have to have the angles. You know, the nail can't go in skew. It's got to go in straight. You know, the joint yeah. must be perfect. And, and so all that woodworking technology uh, sort of stuff um, was in this imagery when you were talking. And, and so God, is, God doesn't want you to walk before or run before you can walk. So... So I know you're going ahead in your mind, you know, the advertising and the marketing and all those things. And, and God is going, I want to showcase your handiwork. I, I want people to see how incredible the work is that you do, you know, and, and to comment about that and speak about that and see the master's work, as it were, in your handiwork. And so... Whilst you're concerned about income and that, and I think part of the stuff we were trying to share today is take that out of the equation and just follow the mandate of God. Take one step at a time, put this foot forward, that foot forward. Just walk slowly and trust God to do the things that you are talking about. I've got my own business and I'm telling you, when I'm doing the things that are right with God, I get phone calls out of nowhere. Nowhere. They just come and somebody phones me and says, sorry, I heard you do this. Can you come and do it for me? And uh, so, and it's all about experimenting with God. I think Justine spoke about it. I didn't get to speak about it. What do you do with your first fruits? Have you tried it with God? Have you said to him, I'm going to experiment and see if this works? You know, people tell me I'm as tired and I'm as this and that. I don't know if it's true, God. Well, go and find out. <laughs> God says, yeah. test me, you know. Prove me. Does this thing work? Whatever it is, first fruits, all these things. Uh, God wants to tell you, this is your trust time. This is a time when you learn how to trust God. And he puts his trust and faith in you and in your family. He will take care of all the issues that you're worried about and concerned about. Just walk the walk and spend the time. However you do it, I mean, I'm not talking about crawling in a cupboard. I'm just talking about, yeah, have the conversation with the Lord. God, yeah. how, is, 
Where is this going? What's the mandate? Where am I going to? How is it going to work out? And let God do what he does and you do what you do. Your skill, apply it appropriately, apply it meticulously, step by step, just do it. God will do the rest. You know what I see in the future? I'll tell you. And I get worried about prophesying so far in the future. But I saw a massive warehouse, massive, that will one day be a business that you'll be working from. And, but you're not there yet because you're right. Skills have to be developed. Trust between you and God have to be developed. And he has to access your life more than he can currently. And that's a simple truth. Um, he needs to access your life. You need to access his life and get in that, that river of God and become the conduit and then the vision of God to give you a massive factory. It's a massive thing that I saw. Uh, sure. Lots of woodworkers going on, you know, all the stuff happening, piles of wood. I see all of that in, 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 in a promise to God, to you. But you Amen. need to walk there. It's not going to be bestowed upon you tomorrow. You have to walk there. You have to get there. You have to, you know, gain the, the, the uh, ability and the skills and the knowledge that's required to take you there. And you're on the road. So, yeah, here's how you've started. Day one, right? God, I'm going to trust you that your word will come true, that it will come to pass, and I'm going to walk through. That's all I can say. That's what the Lord's saying to you. Okay. Thank you. Oh, that's, that's, that's awesome. Can I, sorry to interrupt. I just want to finish with Dwayne. Um, just when Dean was saying, I see a nail and a piece of wood, it signifies your relationship with God and how you have just, it's like you've taken parts of yourself and nailed it on the cross with him and said, God, that's part of my life sanctified God, I'm giving up that part of my life. God, it's just the sacrificial heart you have that you've pursued the Lord. And um, I just can't keep re-emphasizing the tremendous work he's done in your heart and in your life and how powerful your story is. So, yeah, um, we just, it's exciting. It's just exciting to, to see what God has shown us about your life. And, yeah, so... Business side, that's just going to flow. That's a given. It's what he's going to do, what you're going to be doing in the kingdom for him. That's incredibly exciting and awesome. Uh, Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Well, we had another hand, but I see that um, the lady's dropped off. Mina's dropped off the call. So um, anyone else got a hand that's, that's up that needs prayer for something? Is that lady Carl still here? Did that lady Carl leave? Carla. Anybody know her? That, that's actually my daughter, Dean. Oh, is she gone? Yeah, she's she, gone. She might have left already, but yeah. Oh. Did you have a word for her? Yeah, I'll WhatsApp it to you. Please, that will be wonderful. Thank you, Dean. Pleasure. Anyone feel led anything else? Um, or are we all good? Andrew? Yeah. There's, there's um, an enlargement of your territory coming. There's an enlargement of your eyesight coming. Um, I felt the Lord whisper in my heart that he's enlarged your heart. And, and over this period of time, there's been a massive increase in capacity. And um, you kind of been feeling at odds because you don't quite know how to apply it. You're not quite certain if it still applies to some of the things you've been doing. Um, and you're trying to think, is this energy, you know, for what I've been doing and the fields that I'm in, 
And um, I want to tell you that God uh, has, has taken you a season of your life where your tent pegs are going to be stretched out and your tent's going to be enlarged. The territory is going to be increased. I kind of feel it's like a bit of what I was sharing, you know, where, where God is adding to. He's saying, you know, you've been faithful when I gave you the small picture. You said, okay, it's a small picture, but yeah, I'll do that. Um, and, and you've reached a phase where the faithfulness that you've demonstrated towards God and the call on your life um, and some of that stuff we're talking about benefiting the nations, you know, with a bigger picture, that I'm here for a bigger picture. Um, and God is now at a place where he's saying, I'm about to actually terrify you, but in a good way, <laughs> not terrifying the world way, um, by giving you this stunning purpose. Um, that when your eyes open to it, when those things that are swimming there now that, 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 that you're still trying to identify just suddenly turn out and become firm in your heart and mind, it'll terrify you. Because then you'll go, God, that's big. That is actually huge. And, and all of my time, I've been dreaming. I've been praying. I've been hoping, actually. Um, asking for more. But it's been a while. But the Lord has reached a place where he goes, Andrew, your heart is solid. Your heart is pure. He finds integrity there. He finds a desire for truth and to walk it out and to exhibit it and to show it, to demonstrate it, to be helpful, to be generous with your time, with your knowledge, with your skill, that he's going to sow you out as a seed. You won't be tied to an office a lot. You will find yourself being called. Your expertise will be sought out, drawn upon. You're going to have to develop itchy feet because God wants to sow you out as a seed. And it's, it's always been about the seed. God blesses the seed. And uh, the seed of your life is it going to grow into, into an oak of righteousness. It'll provide shade to the nations. I don't know what you think about the nations. Maybe you've gone already. But um, the hearts of the nations are going to open to you. Because there's a genuineness. There's an honesty. There's a pureness. And um, the sanctification of your life. It's at a stage where, where uh, God can show you off. You know, you can begin to say, hey, Andrew, <laughs> I can show you off now. I can speak boldly about you. I can, rec I can make recommendations. You know, we do that. Sure, Justine does it, makes recommendations. M M Melinda, we speak about people we trust. We make recommendations. And so, you know, the Lord's sitting up there in heaven on his throne and he's going, hey, <laughs> Andrew, I can trust you, mate. And um, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to push you out there. I'm going to show you off. I'm going to demonstrate your heart. Uh, I'm going to sow you as a seed so that you reproduce. I know your heart is to reproduce. But now God wants to reproduce you. Now he wants to take the dream and take the vision and take the actions and say, I'll show you how it's done. I'll cause you to reproduce in the earth. 
So, Andrew, the Holy Spirit is on you. Conviction of God is in your heart. And um, a lot of the conversations you've been having, you will see the fruit. You'll see the fruit of that. Your, your territory will enlarge. Um, you've got the capacity to be busy. <laughs> Shame. <laughs> but, but God will make you busy. God will make you very busy. Um, but you won't grow weary and you won't grow tired because it'll be the call of God. All intersecting at this time. Everything that God has placed in you, everything that he's um, said over you, all those things, you'll see multiple fields starting to have crops in them. Not one field, multiple. And so bless you, Andrew. Father, I thank you for the testimony that is on Andrew's life. Amen. Amen. I thank you, God, for the grace that's in his life. I thank you, Father, for the relationships, the strong relations he has, because you've made him a relational person. You've made him somebody that makes connections and takes godly advice, God, and intersects with lives and speaks truth firmly, not aggressively, God, but firmly, and he holds to the line of truth. And so, Father, I thank you that much of what you've done in his life is the revelation of how you mean to take us all forward at this time, God, to move the remnant of God, those who've been chosen, Father, to carry the flag of Christ into this new day so that people can see where you're going clearly. So, Father, there's a prophetic edge over Andrew's life, God, one where he is a sign, he's a notification, God, He's a pointer. He's a roadmap. He's someone that we can look to with confidence and trust. And people can say, that's where God is going. And so, Father, I thank you for that over his life. I thank you that you give it increase, as you've been said, in, at this time said you will. And so, Father, bring your word to pass rapidly over his life. In Jesus' name, I give Amen. thanks. Amen. 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 Bless you. Thank you, sir. Amen. Mm, sure. Linda, I'm still out. I've been blessed so much today, so I'm, I'm flat to say. <laughs> so I'll leave it over to your, to your wise words, young lady. Can I just say one more thing quickly? Uh, I just wanted to say one more thing quickly. The this um, Saudi Arabian guy that I've been dealing with, I actually had the boldness the other day to say to him that uh, it's nearing the end times. Time is really short. And when I say Saudi Arabian, I mean dishcloth, full Arab regalia, not sort of a businessman in a suit. But I said, times it's the end times. I'm praying that Jesus reveals himself to you. In other words, I've taken that risk not to care about business first, but to care about God revealing himself to, um, to the Arab nation, to the Islamic people who are so lost, who so believe that they, um, you know, are going to heaven. And even when they opened the whole ceremony last night in the name of Allah, I just, rebuked it and replaced it in the name of Jesus and I just feel that that might be one of the most important reasons why I'm going over because this guy's very intellectual and he's asked so many questions especially about the trinity how can you have three gods and I've explained to him it's like the sun the sun has heat it has energy and it has light and it's got to have all three to be the sun that's what our god is and so it's not three different gods it's one god so uh, closer to the time when I go, I'll ask for prayer that that perhaps becomes something that enlightens uh, him and, and whoever else I meet. I came on late. Hello, everybody. My name's Cheryl. Um, 
So yes, I do hope that this was taped, that we would be able to get the recording. And Aldine, I just love, love, love this testimony. And we'll be praying for you and that it's breakthrough. It's breakthrough. And we just, yeah, that the Lord would just reveal himself in dreams and visions to them, even in the night, even, yes. oh yeah, just so excited. Yes, yes nothing yes. goes to waste. Yeah, so excited. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's what I said, that, that he has a visitation from Jesus and he can ask whatever questions he wants. Like, yeah. wow, you the Savior. Yeah. Did you really rise from the dead? Like, you know, so oh, amazing. Thank just, you. Pray that okay. the Lord would also give you words of knowledge. Yeah, to give to yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Good. Thank you, everybody, um, for your participation today. We're going to wrap this recording up and I'm going to close in prayer. That's good for all of you. Okay. Holy Spirit, Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your presence with us today as um, We've heard what you're saying to us, and it's reached deep into our hearts, Lord, and that we would walk in the, what you have, have shared with us today, Lord. Lord, I pray for every single person on this platform and for this recording that will reach the right people, because we know, God, that you are with us in every area of our lives. And Lord, we just thank you as this year starts to come to a close as we're heading towards the end of this year but how faithful you have been in every area of your life and Lord I know that this has been a year of positioning and realigning your people and realigning those of us in business in preparation for all that you have for us for next year thank you Lord that we're going to enter times of incredible miraculous provision miraculous encounters miraculous connections Lord I just say to my spirit an incredible escalation in your blueprint for each and every one of us it's going to be such a quick work Lord because it's been a time of preparation for each of us in our hearts it's been a time of refining a time of purifying a time of shedding and taking of cloaks of fear, cloaks of unbelief, cloaks of anxiety. Lord, as you've walked us through seasons of in the wilderness, in the desert, Lord, literally with the, those of us who have been flicking off as it said, as we've come through those times of preparation and times of transformation. And Lord, look what you've done in our lives. Look what you're doing in our lives. Lord, we give you all the glory and all the and all the praise and Lord we are filled with excitement we are filled with hope Lord in all that you have planned for us thank you Lord you establish our territory Lord as you've gone before us to make the crooked path straight Lord we will walk in all that you've called us to in Jesus mighty name Amen Amen. Cool. Let me. Thank you so much.